loud. Terrific. Okay, we are okay. now recording. We are now recording. Great. So we, we have to be on a best behavior or else it gets captured for all of history. So just to <laughs> let everybody know. So, um, so first, I, I do want to say that I hope everybody is remaining safe and healthy during this difficult time. Um, if you have not had the chance to go to our website recently, we have a number of blogs now about the pandemic um, and about the basically the failure that it's demonstrating in our global system and how a world federalist perspective um, can, re if not remedy, pr actually prevent this kind of situation in the future. Uh, those blogs have been written. Oh, let me just l let everybody know to go on mute if you're not currently on mute, if you're not speaking. Um, so yeah, so back to what I was saying. So, um, so yeah, so we have a number of blogs there about the current situation. We invite you to visit them. Uh, there are more being written all the time. Uh, most of them that are up there right now are from our, our bo own board members. Uh, but we're getting them in internationally. We, we have, uh, Andrea sent this one from someone in Germany. So, uh, so there's good material there. So, uh, and, and did I gather that we have at least one or two people who are joining us for the first time? Did I, is that correct, Gail? Um, uh, actually, or Donna, Doug, anybody? Doug, Douglas Perry was with us last time, but I had, didn't meet oh, him okay. last time. And Cassandra gotcha. looks, Cassandra is new, I think. I see Cassandra's joined us. I think she's a St. Louis person. Yes. Yes. Um, oh, great. Okay. Well, let me, let, me, uh, just welcome, let, me, let me just welcome the new people, uh, whoever you may be, uh, for joining us. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, uh, my name is Bob Flax. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, and I'll be facilitating the meeting today, uh, as Gail just said. And Gail is one of our long-term board members. Uh, she runs the book club, and as she said, she'll be doing the timekeeping and keep the queue uh, for today. So um, I know, just to remind everybody, at our last session, we decided to do an experiment, uh, which is to do, use a different format. So rather than have a presentation first and then a discussion, we're going to cut right to the discussion. Um, in a second, I'll talk a little bit more about the format of that. And we'd very much appreciate um, at the end, when we're all done in 90 minutes or so, if you could take a minute or two just to give us some feedback, uh, send it in to Gail and myself. You don't have to copy everybody. Um, and because we, we, we continue to want to improve this. Um, and if you can give us your sense of, of the uh, format of you doing a presentation as compared to not doing a presentation, that would be great. And if we stay with the, what we're doing today, the just discussion, uh, if there's anything we could do to further improve that. So any feedback is appreciated. We try to be as responsive as possible. So the way we'll be conducting today's meeting is that, and I do hear one or two people in the background. So if you haven't yet muted your phone, please do. Um, so the way we're conducting the meeting, as Gail just said, is we put out a call over the last week for discussion questions. Uh, Donna submitted about five questions and topics. And as you heard, Ben submitted one as well this morning. Um, what we'll do is I'm going to call on Donna first um, to select, you know, to, to tell us, you know, one of her questions, whichever she'd like to do. And then Gail will take a queue of up to five people who would like to respond to that question. So there may be other things you want to talk about, but hold that for after. So we'll, we'll stay focused on that one question. Um, as Gail said, each person will have up to three minutes or so. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and Gail will let you know when you have 30 seconds left and then the end of the three minutes. Uh, you don't have to stop mid-sentence. Feel free to finish your sentence if you're in the middle. Um, and then we'll go on to the next person. Um, we expect that, the, that each question might get about 15 to 20 minutes of discussion on it, because uh, we would like to cover a number of questions rather than just stay on one. Then when we're done with the, um, with the first question, we'll pick someone else to ask the next question or present the next topic. Um, and then that, that second question could be one that uh, Donna submitted or that Ben submitted, um, or you can ask one that you came up with. So that's fine. And we'll continue to do that until we're about 
uh, you know, five to 10 minutes until the end. We'll begin to wrap it up. And then I'll turn it over to Gail to confirm the next meeting and make the uh, final announcements. So that's, that's how we'll, we'll try it today. Um, one kind of um, warning that I should give is we have now, um, I guess we've, we've um, come up in visibility because we've had our first Zoom bombing. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a Zoom bomb, Zoom bomb is, it's when someone outside an organization comes in, basically hacks their way in or comes in under the radar into a meeting and messes it up te technologically, jams the signal, does all kinds of things. So in one of our UN 2020 uh, sessions within the past week or so, um, we had a Zoom bombing and they had to, after like five minutes or so, had to end the session. So, um, so if that happens again, or what I should say is what we're doing to prevent that is if anyone else shows up, we will stop whatever we're doing and check that, you know, check in with them to see who they are. If they do not identify themselves, we will banish them from the empire. Uh, so we'll just eliminate them from the conversation uh, so that they don't ruin it. Um, so just to let everyone know, if we stop abruptly, uh, that is why we want to check each person and make sure that they should be here. Um, We'll remind you at the end, if again, if you care to give feedback um, and all that. So without any further, so anyone have any questions just about logistics or anything like that? Oh, terrific. So um, I, think, I think as they say in Hollywood, on with the show. Uh, so Donna, if you would uh, start us off with the first question. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'd like to start with my question number five because I feel like it's a topic maybe we should be writing about or addressing. Um, on pages 85 and 86 in his book, Ron, oh, first of all, I just wanna say in front of everybody what a fabulous book this is and how much I'm enjoying read it, reading it. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that we are reading this. It's just so important. And I'm sort of embarrassed that I haven't read it before since I've now been been working for World Federation for about only 10 years. That's not much by your guys standards. But anyway, <laughs> but I, I um, uh, uh, Ron mentions about one of the that one of the needs for global governance is to help manage outer space or deal with outer space. And I have been very wor worried, worried ever since President Trump created the US Space Force. And I'm kind of you know, sort of did he break any treaties? Did Shouldn't we be saying something about this? And I have two quotes that I found there recently here in Cincinnati, we had a um, the uh, Apollo 11 exhibit at our one of our museums here. And when I went to see it, I took pictures of two of the statements that I found. One was the National Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958 said, and I quote, the Congress hereby declares that it is the policy of the United States that activities in space should be devoted to peaceful purposes for the benefit of all mankind. And the second uh, thing I took a picture of was a plaque on Eagle's front legs when it landed on, it, on the moon. It said, and I quote, Dear men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind. So, um, so, so uh, that's, that's the point in the discussion I'd like to have is what, sort of what shouldn't we be clamoring out in horror that Trump is creating a U.S. Space Force and created another arm of the military. And how come there hasn't been any up outcry? And anyway, that's it. OK, thank you. Good. Thank you. Before I, I ask Gail to take the cue, let me just modify an instruction I gave earlier that if someone appears in the middle of the discussion, but they're on camera and we know them, we'll just continue going. So if you were wondering why we didn't interrupt. Uh, when Bob showed up, that's why. Although I don't know if the cookie monster behind him is a member. So we may need to check into that later. So, that um, so Gail, blue, what? That is the blue that? blob from Xavier University. So. I stand corrected. I stand you corrected. Do. Okay. You do. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, Gail, take it away. We hear your Gail, lips moving, on but mute. you're on mute. Sorry, Gail, you're, you're on mute. mute. If you'd Better. like to respond to Donna's question, uh, let me know. You can raise your hand if you're, you know, visible. Um, and if not, just you have to say something. Be sure you're off mute if you're trying to say something. So Ron is in the queue. Other people in the queue? Uh, Evan? Anyone else? Okay, Ron? Can you hear me? Okay, David Gallup and Ben also raised their hand. Oh, David and who? Yeah, if you, if you raise your hand, you have to put it in front of the camera. If you raise it on the side, oh, it's hard to see. Point. So like in your face, you know? Okay, thank you. And maybe The other name was Father, Ben Ermston, Father Gail, ben. Father Ben. Okay, so Ron, Evan, David Gallup, Father Ben, was there someone else? Okay, Ron? Can you hear me? Yes. I'm, I'm very interested in this question because it's so important to understanding how international law functions at this time. Before we have a world government, we have international law based on treaties. But there's no enforcement. The only way that it gets enforced is when other national governments respond in some way. And that, in fact, is exactly what Trump has done. What he's saying is that we are no longer obligated to follow the treaty because the Russians and the Chinese have already violated the treaty. And that has been his viewpoint, that now, the United States is no longer bound by the treaty because these other countries are not abiding by the treaty, so why should we? So he knows that what he's doing with the U.S. Space Force is contrary to the treaty, but it doesn't bother him because he says they've already broken the treaty. Nobody's going to do anything about it. Okay. And have they broken the treaty, Ron? Did they break the treaty? If I can ask a follow-up question, did Japan and Russia really break the treaty, or is that just something he's saying? I don't know the answer to, the, to that. I'm all I know is that's what he's saying as part of why he's coming up with this U.S. Space Force. It's because yes, there is evidence on that. Yes. There is evidence on the treaty. Hey, Evan is next. That's what he says is why the U.S. is doing what it's doing. Thank you, Ron. Evan? You're on mute. Take yourself off mute, Evan. You're on mute. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to uh, outrage you. Add to your outrage by quoting something from a conservative blog that I've read, came across, um, relating to uh, space exploration. So, uh, despite here, quote, despite the current chaos caused by the coronavirus, Washington must consider the future, which explains the president's new executive order that would allow private resource development on the moon and asteroids. It clearly rejects the common heritage of mankind rhetoric displayed by the United Nations on behalf of the Law of the Sea Treaty, which four decades ago created a special UN body to seize control of seabed resources. And the conclusion of that article is the best option would be to bring together those nations with potential for exploring and commercializing space to draft what for seabed mining was called the reciprocating sales agreement. That pact created a system for resolving conflicts among ocean floor mining claims. It was never used since mining never proved financially viable. However, the agreement would have facilitated any commercial activity by creating a mechanism to resolve disputes. Um, and they say in the longer run, this is actually maybe positive, Washington should work with some of the same governments to develop a more formal international framework 
perhaps to be blessed by the UN Security Council, which is dominated by industrialized powers in space. And uh, they uh, do cite the Moon Treaty, um, which uh, uh, prohibited the use of the moon to um, um, commit any um, threat or use of force or hostile act or threat uh, um, you know, military um, action. So there's a lot of uh, contradictory things uh, that uh, need to be uh, explored. Okay, Dave Gallup. Yeah, hi. So there is um, United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, which is the uh, UN uh, department that's in charge of dealing with outer space, there are five uh, space law treaties, which some of you, you know, some that you've already mentioned about protection of the moon and other celestial bodies, uh, retrieving astronauts who might get lost in space. Um, anyway, but I think what I learned uh, from Ron's book that, that made really great sense and which was repeated in, in almost every aspect of, of problems with the current system is that someone, uh, you know, like a head of a particular uh, state within a, even a world federation, if they tried to go out and uh, use resources from the moon on their own, like, you know, uh, with a space force or something, that individual could be taken before uh, a court, which doesn't exist yet, but, but could, or there could be a world uh, peace or police force that could go after them. And that, that's what I see, of course, is the problem with our, our current system, which, which totally makes sense to me, Ron. Thank you for, for educating us on that and, and re reaching out and, and grabbing the individual, you know, and that's, that's what would work in a, in a, but that's what can't work in our system now because it's government against government. Despite the fact that there are those five treaties. <laughs> Father Ben. Thank you. Years ago when I was at Xavier, I had a radio show and one of my shows was on weapons in space and if someone or some nation uh, got a weapon in space that was able to zoom down uh, to a target on earth uh, they could control it would naturally uh, people are going to respect uh, uh, a, a, a bomb uh, coming from uh, space. And uh, my recollection is that at the time, this was several years ago, there was a treaty and all the nations in the world voted against having uh, any weapons in space except two. Uh, one was the United States and the other was Israel. Uh, and uh, the United uh, States, uh, I don't know whether they, they ever changed that or, or not, but uh, there was a danger of, of some country having weapons in space and threatening to use those weapons uh, down to earth. So uh, I think that that's another reason for uh, World Federation, namely control of weapons in space. That uh, we don't, uh, I wouldn't want weapons in space. Great, thank you for the bin. Other comments? Gail, is that the whole queue? Yes. yes. But Evan, yeah. okay, uh, great, yes. We can yeah. go back to Evan since. Yeah, one, one mm -hmm. further comment is this, this blog proposes a really a consortium of developed and you know industrial countries to govern space. Now, if there were ever a prescription for an anti-democratic uh, dominance of the, the world, that's it. Um, to have uh, the industrialized powers uh, govern exactly what Father Ernst was talking about, what 
uh, weapons uh, could be placed and 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 um, and and really dominate earthbound countries. Great. Thank you, Evan. Good point. Well, should we move to our next question? Uh, sure. Um, I, I, I'd like to call Father Ben since he um, submitted the question this morning. So I'll give you a second to retrieve your question. But since we're speaking about space, I just want to point out one small step for man and giant leap to humankind. Uh, Ron, this is your first time on video, correct? Well, it's the first time with this group. I've been on. Right, right. I've been using Zoom with other meetings. Great, great. Well, I invite you, to, I, I, I welcome you to the Zoom generation uh, in this group. So well, thank you. We had a little trouble at the beginning, but finally got my sound working. Great, terrific. Also, while, while Ben's looking for his question, may we welcome Prosper, who has joined us. He's, oh. um, we're really, this is his first meeting, I believe, and we want to welcome, thank him for joining us. And maybe he could introduce himself a little. Just a oh, terrific. Yes. <laughs> you can get off mute, Prosper. Prosper, are you there? Prosper, do you know how to do that? I guess he can't say if he knows how to do that. Okay, he just said thank you in the chat box. Oh, okay. So, okay, so if you want to introduce yourself at a time later, you can just say in the chat box and we'll call on you to say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself. So, Father Ben, would you like to ask your question? Well, my question is general. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the book uh, that Ron uh, produced, the, the issues there uh, should be part of public discourse and academic discourse. And I don't know uh, how to do that. Uh, how can we get the questions? The book, as Donna says, is worth reading. But uh, how can we get people to read the book or even think about the issues that are proposed in the book. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. So, responses to that question. Okay, Bob, <laughs> uh, Melanie, okay. others. Okay, Bob, go ahead. Yeah. Well, Father Ben, first, I'll just say, you, I'm sure you haven't seen it yet because I, you asked that online, you know, and I wrote an email in response telling you about the variety of things that CGS is doing right now to get this out both to the public and to the academic world. So after the meeting, you'll see the things that we're doing. Uh, but certainly, if anybody else wants to respond as well, that, that's fine. And then we'll get into the content of the book. Um, you know, we'll, we'll return then to the content of the book in addition to talking about marketing the ideas. So, um, I would like to say who is second? Melanie? Melanie? Hi, everyone. Yes, I love this chat. Well, chapter Chap four is my favorite, Ron. So good. And I can't wait for five to see the, the <laughs> contrast. But um, just to follow up with Bob, yes, uh, what CGS is doing is incredible, getting the word out. We're helping with the movie, theworldismycountry.com. We're actually going to put it on YouTube. So um, we're getting more people looking at it that way. So I'm very excited about that. And that will help too. So it's a, a unified effort by everyone. You know, everyone can do something. So it's all of us together helping with that. Thank you very much for your, all you're doing. <laughs> hey, Ron, you wanted to respond? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. I want to say that one of the reasons that I have been supporting Tad Daly on his attempt to write a book is I think that that is another way that we can get some public attention. If Tad gets that book finished and it gets published, 
and it's anything like his previous book, that's going to have an impact. It's kind of ironic. People don't read books, but you got to get a book published in order to have people pay attention to what you're saying. So once Tad gets the book published, then he will have the opportunity to get on TV shows and so on, and that will really help us. But I think this is the next important step in our movement is to have Tad get that book published. Hey, thank you, Ron. Anybody else before I pick the next questioner? Okay. Dave Gallup, you need Dave? to get off mute. Oh, yeah. So, wait, am I muted? Yep. Oh, now you are. Not anymore. <laughs> You're back on mute. Okay. Okay. So I was just going to quickly say uh, to Father Ben is that uh, CGS and, and Bob May was going to go into this later, but we have a Peace and Justice Studies Outreach Program. And one of the long-term goals of that program is to build a curriculum that can be put in schools first in North America and then in the rest of the world that would include books like, like Ron's World Federation book or Tad Daly's new book. Uh, so students could see it and it could be actually taught in schools. I'm uh, also starting to work with Larry Whitner on our peace organizations outreach uh, and then bring these books maybe to the, to the peace uh, um, activist field, to the environmental field and to the human rights field. So we are, we are in the long term effort going to be getting these books out. Good. Thank you very may much. I, may I ask who just yeah. called in from area code 415? David Campbell. Hello, good morning. David Campbell. Welcome. Hey there. Uh, new to the group. Are you okay. think He's new to the group? Before. New to the group, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. We're, we're, we're in the middle. Oh. Yeah, just trying to Oakland, uh, just, play yeah, some. just across the bay, Oakland. Great. Oh. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you. So we're, we're um, just to let you know, David, we're asking everyone to mute their phones when they're not speaking and you can just follow along with our format. So, so thank you, Very Father good. Ben, for the last question. Great. So thank you, Father Ben, for the last question. So do we have a new questioner? And again, you could use your own question or if you want to draw on one of the ones that Donna had prepared and sent out. And if not, I'll see Donna's hand. Okay, let's circle full, full circle back to Donna. Yes. I have, a, I have a different question from the ones I wrote because I hadn't quite mm. finished reading the chapter when I wrote my question. And this is um, on page um, 87 and 88, uh, the bottom of 87, the top of 88. Oh, in the book anyway. I don't know about the PDF. Um, Ron talks about, um, about the challenges for getting treaties passed through the U.S. Senate. And I know that that's an area that, that we're hoping to move towards. We used, this is an area that we used to be active in um, several years ago where we would try to um, sign petitions to get treaties passed. And, and I know it's a thing Bob is hoping to start up again. But I found it very interesting reading what Ron had to say about why it's so hard to get treaties passed through our, our um, Senate. Um, given that it, um, so I, I just thought that would be an interesting topic since it's an area that we're looking to move to. I wonder if anybody had any advice on how we might go about trying to get treaties passed again, international multilateral treaties. And why is it so difficult to get it through the Senate? Uh, because the arcs are, um, as he says, that our, our constitute, maybe I'll let Ron explain. Ron, would you explain? So <laughs> you're the expert. Um, okay. Well, the point is that in the U.S. Constitution, it indicates that treaties are the supreme law of the land. So once a treaty is adopted, then that has a really high status in the law in the United States. So if a treaty says something, it is something that the United States is bound to do because it's part of our national law. And is that true for other countries as well? No, this is something that's rather unique to the United States. The idea that we have indicated traditionally 
that we support international law. Not all national governments do that. Interesting. Okay, Dave Gallup, you, is, are there other people who want to be in the queue? So Dave Gallup, then Bob Flex, and anyone Dave else? Otten. Dave Otten. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Dave Gallup. Well, so, I mean, the, the basic answer to the question is how do we get, make sure that governments like the United States um, sign these treaties is, well, I, I would say is vote in a Democratic president and vote in a Democratic Congress. Because for, for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was I think like 1967 or 1969 was when it was uh, first, you know, uh, came onto the scene. It wasn't until President Clinton in 1992 when it finally got ratified. Uh, and so usually these treaties, I, I from my you know, view of the history have, have come into effect when there's a democratic gov a government, both president and Congress. And just another quick thing, uh, for example, with the uh, Children's Rights Convention, you would think that, that you know, the United States would support a Children's Rights Convention because there's a lot of support for rights of children. But one of the reasons they don't want to support it is because they want to be able to keep the death penalty for ch uh, children, for people who are under 18 who might commit murder. So this is a reason why they don't want to sign treaties like that, because they don't, like Ron was saying, they don't want to be bound by certain requirements of those treaties. Okay, Bob, you're next. Hey, thank you. Um, yes, in, in Donna's question, she mentioned that, uh, she said Bob wants to get that going or, or, or support that. So I just wanted to say a word about that, that, you know, as, as an organization, Citizens for Global Solutions, is both for our ultimate goal, which is the World Federation, but also for in interim goals, things like supporting international law, building global institutions, et cetera, et cetera. But even though we say that verbally, in the last couple of years, we haven't had programs or that many programs uh, and, and haven't done things in our short-term goals. As an organization, we kind of pendulum swung from years ago, just focusing on that, and now we've swung over to the other end of mostly talking about World Federation like we're doing in this book club. So what, what we're looking to do now is it essentially come back to the middle and do both. And one of the ways we're doing that is, is a number of you may know we're redesigning our website right now. And uh, we're just beginning to. And on the website, we're going to have a list. Or not, it's not going to be a list per se, but there'll be um, all of the treaties that are sitting there on the desks of the Senate uh, waiting to be ratified in the areas that we focus on in peace, um, human rights, the environment, and also be things like getting us back into the Paris peace, I'm sorry, the pa Paris climate agreement and things of that sort. So we're going to have it set up so that people can, you know, click on the name of the treaty or agreement or whatever, read about it, learn the details about it, just like we're discussing now. And if they want to support it, they'll be able to click on to either a petition or an individual letter going to their senator or in some way begin to gather steam around that. And in addition to that, they'll also have the opportunity to support us, to make a donation, because that's the work we're doing. And that will also make it much easier for us to then join coalitions in those areas. Because we'll find out the other organizations that are supporting the same treaties and institutions, and then we can, you know, go to them and say, hey, we're on the same team, let, let, let us introduce ourselves. And this way we begin to get the word out in a much more expanded way through other networks. So that's what we're thinking of right now. We welcome any ideas and suggestions in that, on that accord, uh, but I just wanted to kind of fill in the, the you know, the, 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 the item that um, Donna alluded to. Thank you. Hey, Dave Otten. Um, David Gallup um, said exactly what I was going to say, that until we uh, uh, have a, a Democrat majority in the Senate and a, a Democratic president, we're not, not going to have uh, signings of uh, international treaties. Um, it's just ridiculous that the United States has not uh, signed and ratified the Law of the Sea Treaty and other important international treaties about the, the commons. Um, there's another international scholar, uh, not Ron, who has said this, that um, 
most countries keep most of their treaties most of the time. But that's the problem. I mean, uh, can you imagine if we had traffic laws where most people keep most of their traffic laws most of the time, but without law and enforcement, you're going to have a, a complete chaos. Uh, so Ron's main point in his book, of course, is that uh, we need to go from international law, which is customs and treaties, to world law, uh, which holds individuals accountable for violating them. Um, so, you know, uh, it's great to have treaties, but um, since they're generally unenforceable, um, the whole problem is that international system that we currently live under, and that's why we need a, a change of system that Ron talks about in this particular book to create world law. Great. Thank you, David. Anyone else? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, David. <laughs> Okay, I have a question. I want to draw from Donna's first question, because I, I think this is something that um, people generally ignore. Um, uh, he, she, she says on page 58, some peace activists urge, na urge nations to decrease their military spending, but this is irresponsible in the current environment. Point for discussion. I agree with this statement from Ron and have tried to get this point across to local peace activists in my town, but without much luck. Any ideas on how to communicate this effectively? I think that um, Ron's description of the current um, um, incentives for war and um, kind of nationalistic priorities and the disincentives for not, not doing things that way, I think lays out the rewards and, and penalties structure um, beautifully to show how nations are pretty much locked in to, to being in a, a militaristic system, even if they wanted to. I mean, there are some countries that don't have militaries, and I think they really have taken a risk, you know, like Costa Rica, they're depending on other countries not abusing that. But um, anyway, I think this is something that people don't consider very much. So comments about that. Uh, Ron. <clears throat> I would like to point out that what you said is exactly the main point, and that is the problem is the system. Think about what the result would have been if we had lost World War II. Think how different the world would be if the Nazis and the Japanese had won that war. Wars do make a huge difference, and you can't afford to lose a war. <laughs> That's why you have to have a high military spending, working on new weaponry and so on. As long as the system is the way it is, the national governments are going to do what they're doing. Donna, you're on mute. Yeah, I, yeah sorry. Um, actually, Father Ben was with me when um, we went to one of our local peace groups here in Cincinnati like 10 years ago, uh, you know, sort of so excited about that this seemed like the idea of World Federation was made so much sense as the path to peace. And we were sort of stunned with the reaction we got when we went to the Intercommunity Justice and Peace Center. It was sort of like, uh, you know, like they already had their 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 ideas, their programs, what they were going to do. I mean, I you know, I was so naive. I really expected that they would have the the aha experience that I had just had. Like this makes so much sense. How else are we ever going to end war? I mean, but what I will say is is that you know, I joined the peace committee. I didn't walk away. I mean, because there was really only one peace committee here in Cincinnati, so I joined it. And slowly but surely, they're starting to to hear what I say, and and sometimes even parrot it, and um, you know, but not they haven't exactly joined joined CGS yet. Um, anyway, I mean, they do let me talk periodically. Um, so so I, I'm just sort of saying it is really hard to break through, um, and. Uh, the only advice I have is to just hang in there and keep trying and 
And unless somebody's got a better plan than, than that, let me know. <laughs> Melanie and then Bob and then Ron. I was unmuting on my picture. Okay, so, oh my gosh, yeah, so heartfelt what you had to say, Donna and Gail, because, you know, we, we feel like we can, oh, here you go, here's the solution, here, we've got it, we can do this, and, and, and we're so excited, and finally, you know, we can take action that's gonna work, and, you, and it's just flooring to see people so, you know, and it's just a, a question of, what the people's worldview is so entrenched it's so entrenched we're so used to you know even people say strange things like second world war was the, the good war you know even though you know that's like flooring to me it's so strange and then um you know but as you learn more you get more educated like you're saying people are starting to pair it and also people when they don't know of another option they don't you know if they don't know of this so once they hear it you know just like our movie i'll go back to that just shortly or just for a second, is they, they can hear things and then it doesn't come in. You know, like I have to be around something a couple times or three times sometimes before it's like, oh, well, maybe I can change. Yeah, maybe that is right. So yeah, it's just a question of getting the information out. It's a question of um, having, making something that works that people can gravitate to, you know, not force the old thing, you know, to you know, just make the new thing and the people gravitate to it. Like computers, we're all doing computers, we're all doing Zoom. Nobody before discussed, you know, how, you know, you know, get, get this old system of telephones or whatever. Let's, here's the new system. So if we just present something and then also Star Trek and things like that have really helped us uh, adjust to new ways of thinking. Cause they're like, oh, Federation, that sounds so great because Federation, that's, I've heard that before. So it, sometimes it just takes, more times learning and hearing about it, but we can't get frustrated. We just have to have, here's the new system, let's do that. And, and people will gravitate towards it and it'll be accepted, so. Yay. Bob. Yeah, um, so in, in relation to Donna's question, I just wanna let people in on something that's happening right now, um, which I, I, I don't know, I was a little surprised by. Um, Ted Daly, um, who many of you know, and, and who, as Ron said, is a wonderful writer, um, just wrote a blog that uh, is on our website, so you can check it out there. Um, as you may know, what the blog is about is, is, as you may know, one of the world federalist ideas was to have a UN rapid deployment force. So if it looks like a war is about to start or an internal struggle or something like that, the UN could come in right away before things happen and prevent them. So Tad has been wanting to get that idea into the declaration uh, that's gonna happen around the UN 75 anniversary. Um, and, and that was not accepted for the declaration. So instead, he, uh, he's getting the idea out in other ways and he wrote a blog. So I read it, it seemed very wonderfully persuasive and uh, touching and all that stuff. And it seems like a good idea. So then what Ted did is he tweeted it out and put it out on Facebook and social media. And David Swanson, who also many of you may know, who's a leading peace activist, very much out there and, you know, fighting the good fight, although that's a bad metaphor if we're talking about anti, you know, nonviolence. But anyhow, um, he responded to Ted's, um, you know, Ted's tweet or whatever it was. And, and I, was, I was really shocked. He said something like, oh, um, here's another peace organization advocating for militarization or something. And I looked at that and I said, yeah, he's got a point there. You know, that, um, you know and, and he, it was a very short response, um, but it was kind of like a, a sarcastic quip. You know, here they are again. They call themselves a peace organization and they want another military to be built. You know, and there, there, there are other ways to handle these things. So I wrote to Ted right away. This was like in the last 48 hours. And I, I, I said to him, you know, first I congratulated him on the blog. I read the blog. I congratulated him. Then I read David Swanson's thing. And I wrote back to him. I said, Ted, wow, did you see that? Are you going to respond to that? You know, because uh, I'd like to see what, you know, the dialogue. And then Ted wrote back. And he said, yeah, yes, I will respond. 
So I imagine, you know, he's in the middle of formulating what he's going to say. But there, you know, so those are really two and essentially kind of giants or semi-giants in the field um, wanting the same ultimate goal, but with a different perspective. So I just wanted to let you in on that. That's happening right now. You can go and see our blog. And if you, uh, you know, Google it, you can probably then pick up the dialogue happening with him and David Swanson. So I just wanted to let you know that that's happening now. Thank you. Iran is next. Yeah, I just want to make the point that one of the problems that we have had since our beginning is that other peace organizations do not understand what we're about. They think that you can get peace by getting individuals to commit themselves to nonviolence, like Gandhi did. They think that you can get peace by having a system like the United Nations and collective security. Well, those are steps in the right direction, but they're not going to solve the problem. That's why I'm a world federalist. It's only world federalism that's going to solve the problem. People don't think, first of all, you have to recognize how many of our people are not well educated about international issues. They don't care not that much about international issues. They care much more about domestic issues. But they also don't know their American history. Now that's one thing that's helping us is this Hamilton performance, this musical on Hamilton. Most people don't realize Alexander Hamilton was the main individual who made the United States of America possible. He was a leader of the Federalists. Over and over again, he was the thing, but the one that was making movements forward, including the fact that he worked with George Washington during the Revolutionary War. And that's how he got Washington to come to Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention. So Alexander Hamilton was absolutely critical, but also absolutely critical is the difference between a confederation, like they had the Articles of Confederation and like the United Nations, and how different it is to have a federation like the United States. And that is what our Civil War was about. Remember, Abraham Lincoln never talked about slavery. He said that war is to preserve the union. That's another word for federation. The war is to preserve the union. So I think a big part of our problem is People don't recognize what's going on in international issues. They don't realize that for a long time, and it, you know, I know we're supposed to be nonpartisan, but in fact, the Republican Party has changed. The Republican Party no longer has spokespeople who are for international law like they once had. The Republican Party has been taken over by people after all, it was a Ron, you're out of time. In joining the League of Nations. Okay, Bharat, and I'm going to add myself to the um, list. Gail, Gail, Mike's hand had been up way oh. before Barrett. Oh, I didn't see Mike. Mike. Yeah, his Mike was up a long time ago. Mike is next to and then me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I, I'm really enjoying this uh, book. Ron, thank you for it. Um, I'm particularly interested in the religious dimensions of this issue. Thank I've worked for the Catholic Church all my working life um, as a layperson in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. So Father Ben, I'd like to meet you someday. But anyway, I'm also interested because um, most of my family members are evangelical Christians. And it's difficult to have uh, conversations about these uh, topics with them. So I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, arguments uh, for this from a religious perspective. I, I found the, the second to last paragraph in chapter four very inspiring about um, world government could contribute to our moral, extending and expanding our moral horizons, which I just love that idea. And I'm wondering if there is um, a theology of, of world government that's been written by anybody or, um, that kind of thing. Anybody know of that? 
<laughs> Dave Orton can talk to that. Dave Orton. <laughs> um, yes, Mike, if you um, get me your email address, I'll send you my latest article, which is about religious support for our Democratic World Federation. There I highlight the teachings of the Baha'i faith and also the teachings of the uh, Catholic leaders since the 1960s. Uh, one of the best kept secrets in the Catholic Church is uh, most Catholics don't realize that the Catholic leaders since John the 23rd have promoted world public authority as the solution for world peace. So um, I'd like to send, send you my article and have you read it. And if anyone else wants it and hasn't read it, just let me know. Mike, put your Thank email you. in the chat box. Can you put your email in the chat box and I'll make sure it gets to Dave Auten. Um Also, okay. Father Ben, also Mike, Father Ben has a document with quotes. It's not, you know, an article the way Dave's mm -hmm. is, but it's just a list of quotes from different popes and different uh, documents from the Catholic Church. I'll send you that as well. Ibarad is next. Well, uh, Thank you. I'll be returning to an earlier discussion that uh, Bob brought up about the dialogue between Tad and Swanson uh, on nonviolence. I just want to let people know that for some years in Minneapolis, we have had a very successful organization, and it's an international organization called Nonviolent Peace Force. And they have been quite active in uh, uh, identifying situations where conflicts were, could erupt or were about to erupt. And they've gone to work and have tried to develop negotiations between potential warring parties and have been somewhat successful in some areas. So I think in a world federation, if one were to include uh, some kind of a, rather than arming, as Tad is saying, uh, some kind of a, uh, you know, committed uh, training for nonviolence, and just like Gandhi did to so many people in India to join in nonviolence, uh, you know, even dealing with people, the nationalist Indian army that wanted to fight, Gandhi's people kind of stood opposed to that. And yet they were partners in wanting to have freedom from Brit British. So uh, I just feel that perhaps a uh, little more thinking needs to be done on this, but perhaps this idea of the international, in, you know, nonviolence force, if I can say it, uh, may seem contradiction, but uh, it, it's something to be uh, considered as, as a part of the program from the World Federation. A question of clarification. So if the UN Rapid Deployment Force were a nonviolent peace force, would that be a way of dealing with things? Do you think, Bharat? Well, yeah, I, yeah, the, that's what I'm proposing, a nonviolent peace force. Interesting. Um, I was next in, in the queue, and then it'll be um, Bob, no, Ron, and then Bob. You have Evan, you have Evan too. Ron, Bob, and Evan. Okay. Um, yeah, I you put Evan to, before me. <laughs> I, I wanted to um, say, it seems to me that our, the goal is through World Federation, to change the global structure of rewards and punishments to promote peace and address um, the solution of global problems. I mean, that's what World Federation would do, essentially, is to, strip, to change the global structure of rewards and punishments toward a positive world, uh, world peace and, and solution of global problems. Would you agree with that, Ron? Well, my view is that you don't have to go one way or the other. I think you have to go both ways. And Gandhi did. Most people don't recognize Gandhi not only preached nonviolence for individuals, he was also a world federalist. Gandhi recognized that the international situation 
required some changes and that the thing that had to be done was to change from a confederation to a federation. Gandhi recognized that very well. The people who have promoted nonviolence, they also have talked about an international nonviolent force. And so there's been some effort to have a nonviolent peacekeeping force. It's already, the, I don't remember the name of the organization, but there's an organization that has tried to promote that very idea of an international co uh, force committed to nonviolence. At the same time, they've not been able to do very much. So it seems to me like we have to not choose one or the other, but use both. That is, get a nonviolent international peacekeeping force, but also have one that's ready to use armaments if that's what's necessary in some situations. Okay, Evan. Can I just uh, uh, say something, you know, relative to what just Please Ron respond. said? Okay. And it, it, I just want to say, Ron, I agree with you. Just last night, I was reading uh, a very interesting book about Gandhi and Jinnah. The, the, and, and there was a situation where Gandhi actually uh, applauded use of force in a given situation. Yes. Because the point was at that time, are you going to have the poor and the totally helpless people uh, slaughtered or are you going to prevent the slaughterer by getting rid of them? You know, uh, this was the situation. I, I'm exaggerating it, but somewhat kind of situation that was happening uh, in, in, in the context of the, you know, Muslim League was going after the villagers. There were Hindus at that time. And, and so that's the, that, that's the circumstance that we're talking about. Anyway. Okay, Evan. Yeah, you know, one of the distinctions that will get us out of this dilemma, I think, is force versus violence. And yeah. force is, leg is, is legitimate. It's exercised by a public authority and uh, is not um, a, um, a random uh, destructive event at all. You know, one of the strengths of uh, Ron's book, I think, is the discussion of legitimacy. And his uh, statement, the key, I think, is on page 64, where he says this the, um, uh, second great change which would come with World Federation is the transformation of the relation between individuals and the world governance system. Under, and then I'm skipping, under a world federation, citizens would be able to vote as individuals for representatives in the world parliament who then will, could adopt laws about these matters. And that is, I think, the key uh, to ground level organizing that we could be involved with. In other words, uh, promoting the idea that people should have representation at a world governance level. Thank you. Very good, Evan. Bob. Yeah, two quick things. Um, one, oh, am I off mute? Uh, yes, okay. So one is um, just to uh, explain to people what I was holding up before. Um, regarding the uh, David Orton's article, our last edition of Mondial, which is our journal, which is available online, it's at our website, has an article by David Orton talking about the religious perspective on World Federation. So any of you can see that right away, that that's there. So that, that's item one. Item two that's, is that's if, the if there were... Yes, that's the, so that's the shorter version of David's fuller article. Thank you for for clarifying that. Um, number two is to get to the issue of, of war and what a military force might look like under a world federation. That, you know, when we think of, of war, we have a certain picture of it, 
But remember, if there were a World Federation, we would switch from national accountability to individual accountability. So if there was a a dictator or a regime or a group of people planning a war, what could happen, and this is, I'm just making this up, but what could happen under this new set of international law is the, uh, is first of all, the country is not the enemy. It's the individuals because their behavior is now criminalized in the eyes of world law. So what could happen is the UN, you know, peace force could first of all, for a week before, as they did in World War II, I mean, the UN didn't do this, other places did it, is leaflet a country, drop papers saying, we're coming in to get this criminal who, um, you know, who uh, broke international law. So we urge all of you to leave the area, you know, and and the military, you know, that that country's military force will see it, et cetera, et cetera. And then the army of the world, masses at the border waiting for the get-go, okay? Now, you could imagine how many countries, you know, their small militaries are going to stay versus drop their arms and run. And a lot of that is what happened during Desert Storm, uh, where when the world lined up, um, you know, a a lot of the, um, you know, the Iraqis just ran, you know? So, uh, and those that didn't saw what happened. So, um, so you would not be committing war against the country. You would be going in to arrest the leader or leaders that are the conspirators of breaking international law. So it's a very different ballgame. It now has a police force function rather than a military function, even though they might, you know, carry guns and wear helmets. So I just want to point out the whole texture of warfare could be different under a world federation, because it's no longer warfare, it's a police action. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. myself in the queue. Uh, Oh, Ron, did you want to say something? Well, when we're almost done, I did want to, when you showed Mondial, I do want everyone to be be reminded about the Esplato course that we're going to have. Because it does seem to me like one way that individuals can indicate their readiness to go beyond nationalism is to learn the language Esperanto and become part of a global community so that you're not just so nationalistic. People don't recognize nationalism is really very much promoted by focus on the national language. And so if I'll say that if anybody here wants to join in the Esperanto class, just make a note in the chat area. And if you think I don't have your email, give it to me. But I think most of you, I have your emails now. But we, we are doing a doodle right now to schedule our first Esperanto introductory section. Thank you. I Good. wanted to- And uh, let me, uh, if I could jump in as facilitator, just to point out, we have between five and 10 minutes left for the conversation. So I just wanna see if there's a lot of energy still around this question or if we can get one more in. So are there other folks who wanna speak to this question? Okay, see a hand or two. So Gail, let me turn it back to you to continue. Yeah, I I think there's another problem regarding how you characterize a situation. So um, Barra referred to uh, Gandhi's um, concern about, you know, an attack by one group versus another group you know, uh, this group is about to be slaughtered and therefore we need to send in the, you know, whatever, armed force or unarmed force, <laughs> unfor- whatever force. The problem I see is, is that a legitimate claim? Is it really true that one group is about to be slaughtered? Because that's a problem I've seen with the um, responsibility to protect, where um, there, there was a claim that uh, Gaddafi was going to slaughter, you know, the, uh, the citizens in the eastern, eastern Libya. Well, after he was, you know, the whole country was destroyed and he was killed and so on, uh, there's been a lot of uh, consideration that, well, maybe that wasn't actually the case. Whoops, you know. So that's, that's another piece of things that needs to be, I think, given very serious consideration. Okay, there was another, is he Dave Gallup? Yeah, I don't want to pursue this 
too much. Uh, yeah, let, let's let Dave in, if it's okay. Let me, let's let Dave in. Yeah, Bara, Dave had his hand up first. I'm just so responding to what Gail just said. Oh. Yeah, which we're, we're trying to not do that um, so that we can go in order because everybody is just responding to what someone else said. So we're, we're trying to keep the cue. Thank you. Uh, Dave? Okay, so uh, I don't think David Swanson would have had so much uh, problems with Tad's article uh, if the language used were a little bit different because I, I you know, skimming through it and he used the word army a couple times, although he did use world police force, which would, would maybe have had a, a less of a concern for David Swanson. So I really think the words that we use uh, really can impact uh, how we get our World Federation message out. So that would be one you know, critique I would have given to Tad. And I noticed this was, was surprising to me when Bob and I went to the Peace and Justice Studies Association Conference in Canada, um, I got to go to a panel and, uh, of professors Authors teaching, you know, peace studies, and one of the professors used in his PowerPoint the word fight and and warrior. And at the end of it, I raised my hand. I was and I said, you know, why as a as a peace studies professor are you using uh, war terminology? And his answer, I thought, was a cop out, which was to say, oh, my students understand that much better than if I used a different, like a euphemism or a different word. So my feeling, though, is that we have to move away from these terms like army and fight and warrior. Even I brought up the idea, like, because I do yoga, and you know, there's, there's the a warrior pose, warrior one and warrior two, and this should be peacemaker one and peacemaker two, not warrior. Even in yoga, it shouldn't be that way. And then the final thing is that there's been a sort of a, and, in, and this relates back to what Melanie was saying before, an insidious national um, brainwashing of us, you know, towards the patriot, national patriotism and not humanity, humani I can't say the word, Rod. Human yeah. Humatriotism. Humatriotism, thank you. Uh, and so we need, and one of the things Ron says, which no one's brought out yet, is we do need, uh, from a higher level perspective, a world citizenship uh, consciousness. But Ron mentions this in his book. Uh, and I thought that was a really important point to, to refer back to, that we need to be moving towards that, the language we use and, and towards that. Uh, Thank you. Okay, Barat. Are you asking me? Yes. Your, your turn again. Oh, well, uh, I, I don't want to keep pursuing back and forth as Bob requested. So or let me just simply say that the situation I was referring to was actually happening. It wasn't something, you know, expected to happen. It was actually happening and Gandhi was in the midst of it. And, and that's, that's all I can say. Yeah, I, I wasn't challenging that particular thing. I'm saying it's a more general problem. Yeah. Bob? Yeah, uh, ju just to clarify, it, it's important that everyone's clear on the instructions. So Bharat, I, I wasn't telling you not to respond to someone. I was just telling you to get in line to respond to someone. So um, rather than cutting in, because then everyone else feels that, oh, well, how come they could cut in and I can't? And then the whole thing devolves. So I'm just wanting to make sure we keep the order, but you could respond to anybody. Anybody could respond to anybody. That's how this works. So thank you for responding. Okay. Well, so um, back to you, Gail. For clarification, do we not? I mean, if there's a, just a br brief clarification item, somebody might bump in line. Well, well, then we would need to explain to people what that is, because often a brief question becomes a long statement. So I want to make sure that we don't have the culture fall apart <laughs> with the uh, slippery slope there. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, should we move to another question? Do we have time to do that, or should we begin wrapping up? Dave Otten just to ask to get in the stack. Oh, sorry, Dave, I didn't see you. Dave? Okay, uh, another issue that if we can't finish talking about today, we need to talk about next time in the section of a critique of world federalism is the important question about open borders versus uh, national borders versus closed borders and immigration. Of course, this is a, a major um, issue in our national conversation and something that President Trump has continually brought up. Um, 
within our national federation, we have open borders. I can live in Missouri. I can live in Illinois. I can live in any one of the 50 states because we have a federation. And I can simply move there without having to violate any kind of laws. But in a world federation, Ron, the question would be whether a world federation would have open borders or whether national governments still have a right to limit uh, immigration. Ron? Let me just say briefly that my view would be that you might need to restrict immigration for a few years at the very beginning of the World Federation. Getting a World Federation going is going to be difficult. And it might be that there would need to be some limitation on when immigration could begin. Bob? Yeah, I, I want to kind of combine two or three things. One is if you saw the uh, author and Melanie's movie, uh, My Country is the World or The World is My Country, depending which version, <laughs> you see, that David Gallup says at one point when they're talking about immigration, that people are very reluctant to leave their countries. You know, they, they know the people, they know the place, they want to be there. So if we could essentially if a world federation could couple Juncker's idea that we talked about before the global Marshall plan with protecting the areas and having the people rebuild what was devastated. Most people will, or at least a good portion will want to stay if their safety, their health and well-being is guaranteed to rebuild their countries. So you can both, you know, solve the immigration problem, and solve the, you know, the development problem at the same time if you have a World Federation protecting the people there so they don't have to flee the drug, you know, the drug cartels, the, the poverty, et cetera, et cetera. The whole thing could be wrapped up in one very, I think, very glorious solution. Thank you. Good point. Donna's next. On this same point, Ron in his book on page 76 mentions that one of the advantages of a World Federation would be um, doing a better job of dealing with the economic, the global economic situation. And if we could even that out and make it more fair, there would be less need for immigration and, and refugees because people would be able to thrive at, in their homeland. So that was just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Okay, well, we have just uh, several minutes left. Should we wrap up? Um, unless there's a, a, la a last word that anyone wants to have? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'll say one or two quick things by way of wrap up and then turn it over to Gail. Um, first, I wanna remind everyone of what I said earlier, that if you have any feedback, we've now experienced one session in this format and a number of sessions in the other. So if there's anything you'd like, like to let us know of one compared to the other and how we can improve things further, please uh, send out an email to Gail and myself. We'd very much appreciate that. And, uh, and lastly, I'd like to say that, um, as I mentioned before, we have lots of programs and we're planning many more and a lot of improvements. And believe it or not, some of that takes money. Um, so we welcome your contributions. We welcome uh, donations of any kind. We welcome suggestions about how to do fundraising. We welcome connections to people who are like-minded, who might want to donate. Um, we welcome bequests. If people have not yet put us in their will, we ask you to think about it, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and we welcome volunteers. Um, as, uh, all but three of us right now are volunteers uh, who are making this whole thing go. And if we want to do a small thing like change the world, we probably need a few more people to help. So, um, so we, we welcome your energies. We welcome, you know, whether it's financial or, or muscle. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Gail. Thank you very much for attending. I think we've had a really substantive um, discussion. I've really enjoyed it. So, um, Bart, do you have something quick? Before yeah, I just you... want to make a, a quick request to Bob. Say, Bob, in your uh, CGS uh, website, when you ask for donation, could you also have a form there for people who don't want to donate online but would rather send you a check? I've been a victim of identity theft 
And so I'm somewhat reluctant to just put my, uh, you know, charge number on all kinds of websites. So usually, I see Donna's got her hand in. Donna, there are there are instructions on the website um, on how to do that, and um, if you go to the donate, if you hit the donate button, I'm trying to find it right now. My computer's a little slow. Oh, because I did um, that once and I didn't see any. That's well, if you go to donate and just scroll down, it says, want to find out about other ways to give, just click here. And then that brings up a page that has a lot of information, but one of it is donate by mail. So um, click, so click the donate button. Click okay. on, uh, click here to learn other ways, and then there's a donate by mail where you can click, and it gives you a form to fill out. You don't even have to use that form. You could just make it up, but it gives you instructions. Right. Thank you. And the much. mailing address. And, okay. Yeah, and, and, and let me both thank Barat for the question and use it as an opportunity to just let everyone know we are on the early stages of redesigning the website. So if there's anything about the website that has been troublesome or difficult to find something or whatever, or if you have any ideas about it, by all means, send it to me. We are compiling all of the things we want to do to do the upgrade, and we have limited sets of eyes. So the more sets of eyes on it we have, we can see what the themes are, what the recurrent issues are, and make improvements in those areas. So thank you, Bharat, and thank you in advance for any of those of you who give us that feedback. So the next, the next session is going to be a month from today, June 13, which is the second Saturday of June, the same time, same place, noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And I, I'm using Eastern time as kind of the, you know, the anchor because that's where our office is. But um, you, you, could, you're, you all came, found your way here at this time, so same time. And we'll be focusing on chapters five and six. If you have questions that you'd like uh, the group to discuss, please submit them to me and I'll compile them and, and we'll, uh, we'll tackle them next month. And thanks. For those and Gail, can you stay on? Too. What? Yeah. Gail, can you stay on so we can chat for a bit? Yes, okay. Thanks to Great. everyone who helped participate in this program and to set it up and make it go. Thank you. Thank